Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 390 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how are you doing this week, my man? I'm doing great, Joe. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Always good when speaking with you. Let's dive straight into the review part of the show. This one took place at the York Hall Bethnal Green last Friday, March 31st. Um... Friend of the show, Harlem Eubank topped the bill, now 17-0, a unanimous decision there over 10 rounds against Miguel Antin, who is now 20-12 and 12 with a draw. Antin only had about 24 hours, 48 hours notice for the fight, so to think that he actually went 10 rounds was quite incre- incredible. Um, he, he, he should be proud of himself, actually. He was down in round 6 and round 7, but Harlem Eubank couldn't put him away. Um... Yeah, that is uh, that's that's it's a bad look for Eubank to be honest with you. I really expected he'd get him out of there. Um, so yeah, on on to the next one. Nonetheless, you know I like Harlem a hell of a lot. Really good guy, and um, it's just one of those things. I think he would have he would have probably preferred to get a stoppage. Probably should have got a stoppage, but he didn't get it. You can't always get it, of course, and. It's not like he bangs people out all the time. I don't think he's a massive puncher, really. So maybe I was, you know, asking too much in my mind of him. Um, on the undercard, Abbas Barrow now 13-1. and one, A TKO for him in round three against Ferenc Katona, who's now 11-10 and 10 with three draws. Katona down in the first um, and his corner through the towel in, in round three. Um, Harry Scarf on the card as well. This one was always going to go to points. It really was. I mean, I feel like the whole week of boxing in a hole was quite predictable, to be honest. I think, you know, if anyone bets on boxing, I think it was um, quite an easy kind of week, really. I don't know what the odds were were, uh, were were saying in terms of were they, you know, profitable or good prices. But a lot of the things I thought would happen ended up happening. And Harry Scarf against Jordan Dujon, for that one to go to distance, I mean, it was just printing money, really. But Harry Scarf wins on points. He's now 12-2, and two, a unanimous decision over eight there against Jordan Dujon, who's now 8-2. and two. Um, Yeah, it was what it was, really. A bit of a strange kind of way that they they uh, had the running order as well on, on Channel 5 last weekend. Uh, moving now, though, to the big one. It took place at the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. I watched this one in a pub, which I don't think I've ever done when you know when um <laughs> working i guess you know because I, I watched the uh, uh he's working a bit of a stretch maybe but you know when i watch boxing i don't like to have a drink i don't like to really you know be around too many people i like to you know just sit in front of the tv or be there of course in person and just you know i'm focused on what i'm seeing in front of me and um i never go to like a pub or anything with people but me and one friend of mine we we went to this pub because obviously the zone it's now a tv channel so we went and watched it there and um yeah it was really kind of uh <laughs> you know fun to be there and um Anyway, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, but anyways, really, really good card, I thought, but a lot of very predictable things. I did say I felt Campbell Hatton would get the knockout against Lewis Fielding. He did. He's now 11-0, and Lewis Fielding now 10-8. and um, It was a brilliant body shot in the first round, actually. Left hook to the body, one that I'm sure Ricky would have been proud of. Uh, John Hedges on the card as well. Once again, another predictable points win for him. He's now 8-0. and It was a eight-round fight there. He was able to beat Daniel Bosianski, who's now 11-3. and Jordan Flynn, again, quite predictable. I don't think... I think maybe he's only got one KO win. Uh, but yeah, you know, Kane Baker is always game, and he, he showed up. 
um, and, and Jordan Flynn got the better of him there over eight rounds. So a points win over eight. He's now 9-0. and Moving up the card once more, Fabio Wardley. Again, we all thought he'd probably knock out Michael Polite Coffee. Um, the stoppage wasn't a good one, though. I mean, we can go we can go on about that one all day. It was a quite, quite a poor stoppage, really. Um, it was for the vacant WBA Continental Heavyweight title. Uh, Fabio Wardley now 16-0. and Michael Polite Coffee now you know, in, in, in a terrible position with his record 13 and four. Um, yeah, like I said, the stoppage was awful, but the writing was on the wall. Um, I think Wardley was taking his time. It was, it was quite a lackluster, you know, a lackluster fight really through the first few rounds. Like either guy weren't really throwing many shots and Michael Polite Coffee was quite happy to kind of sit in his shell and, try and counter off the ropes just stuff like that you know it wasn't that imaginative and um yeah when Wardley put a few good shots together the referee jumps in I don't think Coffee was in massive trouble but a lot of the shots were making his head snap back and um yeah the referee just jumped in I think it was a little bit too soon Galau Yafai I thought this one could have gone the distance but he was probably the one thing I didn't see happening um a fourth round TKO win against Moises Cayeros, who is a bit of a veteran. He's now 36 and 11 with a draw, but Kalyafi 4 and 0, three KOs, I believe. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought he'd go long, um, and I didn't expect it to, to, to be over with that quickly, but I think he made quite easy night, you know, quite quite an easy night's work of Moises Cayeros. So um, good stuff for Galau Yafai, who, you know, just doesn't want to waste any time, really. Just wants to whiz straight to the top and get a world title shot. Uh, elsewhere on the card, another guy that I'm sure will be knocking on the door real soon, Austin Amo Williams. Once again, I expected him to get the knockout against River Wilson Bent. He did. Um, he's now 14-0. and River Wilson Bent is 14-3 and with a draw. Wilson Bent down in round seven, and then his corner through the towel in in round eight. Um... I missed the first few rounds of that because I got to the pub a bit late. But, um, yeah, um, from what I could see, you know, he's a tough guy, River Wilson. Ben certainly didn't come to lay down or anything, you know. He got in there and even the bits I did see towards the later part of the fight, he's, he was all blooded and everything, but he was still having a good go. And like I say, I think his corner did the right thing, really. Saved him for another day, threw the towel in. I think he was in a position where he wasn't going to win the fight. He was just taking a bit of a hiding and for a bit too long. And then, yeah, getting on to the main event, Anthony Joshua now 25-3, and three, a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Jermaine Franklin Eddie, who's now 21-2, and two, uh, still hasn't been knocked out. Um, yeah, I mean, we said that Anthony Joshua needed a destructive performance. Um, I said that Anthony Joshua hadn't knocked anyone out in the first half of a fight for over six and a half years. And for that reason, I thought it would go late. And um, I'm not sure if I said it on the podcast, but I certainly said it to a few friends. I said, I tell you what, that price there for Anthony Joshua to win uh, on points by decision was four to one. And for me, I thought that looks like a tasty price. But anyway, forget about the betting and all of that for a minute. Eddie, what did you make of his performance? Um, has he has he impressed you in any way? Um, it's hard to say that he, you know, he, he didn't do well in certain spots. But I think those losses had an effect on his mind, 100%. You know, you can see, and, and, and um, God damn, I can't get his name on my head right in, in my mind right now. Fr- uh, Jermaine Franklin was kind of into it and trying to get his, you know, get him to be a bit, a bit emotional and to kind of remember the difficulty he had with Usyk and some of the other fights. He caught him with some, some, some decent shots, to be fair, at times, you know, but um, and Franklin, he did good. He did some good things. But I, you know, Joshua, you can see that was he was pretty much controlling it. You know, it was it was, it was, it was there were some rounds you could have gave to Franklin. And I, I kind of see what uh, you know his, his new trainer's doing to try to like get him a little bit. Obviously, trying to get him more confident in his jab. Which honestly, that was a lot better than what I've seen in the past. He really utilized the educated jab, especially I think at toward going toward the middle rounds to late. He started to pump it out a little bit more and, and create a little more distance between him and Franklin. He stood. Um, I I do think, and I you know I I think he, he needed to really like light him up. 
he, if he didn't stop him, he needed to just leave no doubt. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't think there was much doubt in who was winning, but Franklin was really making him not look like a world beater. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't it wasn't like after that fight, we're going, oh, yeah, Anthony Joshua's back. He's going to go and he's going to demolish the next guy he fights. There's still a bunch of question marks about him. And most people that I bet, I haven't even seen the people talk about it, but I'll guarantee that most people are thinking, well, if you wanted to fight Fury after that performance, it's not going to go too well. And they wouldn't even, they would, not only would they not favor him, but they wouldn't even think it would be a fight. And that performance didn't say, oh, well, you know, he'll be, you know, he's back or he'll, be, you know, he'll be a real challenge for him. And I think that's what he needed it. And that, I think he needed that. But this was the first fight with a new trainer and, and new concepts to what he's trying to do. He's trying to, you know, you can see him trying to incorporate some things that maybe he didn't do before. Um, you know, work out, like he's trying to work range a little bit. Trying to uh, get a little more comfortable, I guess, even defensively. I don't know. It's just, I, I didn't, I, now that I think back on, what I was expecting him to do and hoping that, you know, he would do, he would be able to do it. I mean, well, if I'm, if I'm a fan of his, which I'm not saying I am or I'm not, but I would hope he would, if, he would, if I was supporting him, that he would go in and just destroy the guy. But this is boxing. And you can't just, you know, expect at the elite level that you're going to be able to do that, especially with a tough guy like this, Franklin. So, um, but even without, even if he couldn't do it, you would still expect him to win in a, in a better fashion than he did. And, um, you know, it's, like I said, it's hard to, you know, put those expectations on him, especially with a new trainer, and, you know, trying to understand concepts that may be foreign to him. So I'm not going to sit here and, 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 you know, just be too critical in you know, But if he's trying to get back to the heavyweight championship of the world, he's going to need better. And, you know, he, him talking about getting there with Tyson, I even heard Joe Joyce's uh, name, I think they were saying, he was talking about, and a couple other guys. I don't know if he wants to even going in, in that direction, if it's going to, because he's going to, it's only going to get tougher. And of course he's been to the top of the mountain, but you know, it, he's a little bit older, you know, like he's doing some new things. It's not going to be easy to adjust. And <laughs> it's, it's like I said, the road is going to be difficult. So, I mean, all the best to him. I'm hoping that, you know, he, you know, he lands on his feet, but man, it's going to be a tough road. Yeah. I think it is going to be a tough road. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a strange performance from Anthony Joshua. You know, you you alluded to it as well, and a lot of people are saying the same thing that he doesn't really seem to be that same fighter. There's a lot of doubts in his mind. He seems to be perhaps even a bit gun shy. Um, it was a it was a very interesting um, start to the fight. I think really what we saw the first you know three four rounds. Um, yeah, Joshua just looked really cagey, and obviously Franklin was more willing to let both of his hands go. Joshua was barely letting his right hand go, just you know, staying behind the jab, um, looking a bit nervous even perhaps. Um, I did give Franklin a few of the early rounds, and like I say, I was quite surprised as well by, by how easily he was able to back Joshua up. Um, you know, Joshua did obviously go on to start, you know, controlling the... Uh, the distance and stuff and you know holding the center of the ring around about the midway point throughout the fight and was starting to have more success finally and then yeah Franklin you know his head movement started to kind of vanish and yeah you know Joshua like I say started to take over from that point onwards I think Franklin had a good start to the fight and Joshua obviously had a good middle and a good and a good finish but yeah I don't really want to go in on it too much I I wasn't that surprised I mean I actually like I say I I was telling people four to one is a good price and um, I really I really would have been surprised if he'd have blown him away quite quite quickly and um, for that reason I I don't think Franklin's all that bad so I'm not one of those guys that say oh wow this performance here he is finished he he needs to retire like all these critical people you know like to be on social media Um, but something isn't he he doesn't quite look the same fighter you know he wasn't he wasn't i mean he landed it a couple of times but we didn't really see that uppercut with that spite that he likes to whip in a lot you know that's one of his best shots and just yeah just kind of a bit gun shy is probably the word a bit gun shy especially early on you know when he was not letting that right hand go it was just like wow and yeah he got hit as well with some really you know nice looking shots like you said uh, from franklin um 
yeah, it just doesn't seem to be the same fighter. Probably got some kind of confidence issues, perhaps. And um, I think it was even Barry Hearn, who obviously is the mastermind really be- behind Matchroom. He actually, if I'm not mistaken, he was the one who said, if, if it was up to me, I'd be telling Joshua, do not take the Fury fight next. I don't know if I'm taking that out of context, but I'm pretty sure I saw that as a headline to a video. I don't know if it was just clickbait or whatever, but... Yeah, he is in a tough position. They're talking about, I think, three different opponents next. I think they said Dillian White, Otto Wallin, or someone else. Can't remember who the other one was. I I reckon they're going to throw him in with Dillian White. (laughs) I really do, and it's a fight that I don't think anyone wants to see. But, you know, go on, Eddie. It was was Joe Joyce. Joe Joyce, yeah, never, 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 never going to happen. Sorry, is that what you was going to say? I thought you were going to say something else. If if you didn't have anything else, Eddie, it's fine. No, you know, I, what I was going to say was you were a couple of things you were mentioning at the time, but I didn't want to stop you in the middle of it. But yeah, and when you were saying about how how gun shy he was, not really confident on his offense going, and and another thing I really wanted to mention, and I didn't like. I mean, I didn't mind it. I understand there's a part of you know boxing and a part of him getting his you know getting in a situation where you don't allow him to get his uh, his stuff off. But a lot of the holding and and and, and and stuff like that at certain times when, you know, the fight was, you know, starting to heat up a little bit, which is not, a, like I said, it's not a bad tactic to use, but when you utilize it as much as he was, there was actually a point where he wasn't throwing almost really much of anything. And every time Franklin came in, he would look to hold and then maybe get a little, you know, sneaky shot on the inside to, like, try to catch him. But... That was kind of irritating me a little bit watching it. But once it started to get a hold of the jab, then it kind of definitely moved in his favor. But that holding thing, I've seen a few fights like that recently where guys are using the clinch a little bit too much and overused it. A lot of times the refs weren't weren't really getting in on it. they got to start saying something about that. I really think that's uh, it's MMA. If you want to do MMA, that's fine. But if, if this is boxing, at the end of the day, clinching is something – you know, when you need to do it, you do it. And it is a tactic, but it shouldn't be overutilized. There we go, Eddie, not a fan of MMA. Um, no, I make you right, I make you right. Moving on, moving on to the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA on ESPN+. Plus. This top-ranked show, we saw Rabisi Ramirez headline. Um, he's now 12-1. and one. It was a unanimous decision against friend of the show, former WBO Super Bantamweight World Champion Isaac Dogbay, now 24-3. and three. Again, quite, quite predictable. Um, obviously, I really wanted Dogbay to win. You know, I'm sure everyone that listens to this show knows I get on really really well with Dog Bay, um, but it was always going to be a tough ask, like I've said so many times, hasn't really looked his old self since moving up to featherweight, and Rabisi Ramirez is obviously a box of tricks, who at this point, um, no one is really seeming to be able to deal with, so yeah, he just, he, he had a lot in his arsenal, we saw it, but also he stepped up as well to a level that he hadn't yet stepped up to as a pro, so it was quite an interesting fight, obviously Ramirez won it, but there was a lot of close rounds that I think Ramirez just pinched, unfortunately, so the scorecards in the end, if I'm not mistaken, were quite wide, um, I don't have him in front of me at the moment, but yeah, so Ramirez now the WBO World Featherweight Champion, Dog Bay down in round 12, but Dog Bay you know, landed some brilliant shots on Ramirez. And I think that's what makes Ramirez quite exciting. You know, obviously, like we say, Cubans have got that got that um, reputation. They're hard to hit. You know, they're really, really difficult to work out. I think he's quite an exciting Cuban and um, you can hit him as well, which I think makes him even more exciting. But yeah, he got the job done. Credit to him. And Isaac Dogbe, you know, it's another really kind of um, unflattering performance in a row for him and you've got to go back about five or six fights in a row it seems like perhaps maybe he could be over the slide but like I say I hope I'm wrong really really love the guy on the undercard as well Joet Gonzalez now 26 and 3 once again quite predictable a unanimous decision against the very tough Enrique Vivas who's now 22 and 3 also on the undercard we saw Jahi Tucker move to 10 and 0 double figure wins for him he was deducted a point though 
from, from hitting on the break in round four. And he was able to beat Nikolos Shekmirzhvili, who I'm definitely saying his surname wrong, but hopefully he doesn't hear it and doesn't want to hit me for it. He's now eight and two. Um, also on the undercard, Jeremiah Milton, the heavyweight, moved to nine and oh, a unanimous decision there over eight rounds against Fabio Maldonado of Brazil in search of in search of uh, win number 30, but he didn't get it. He's now 26 and, oh, sorry, 29 and 7. Um, Maldonado as well deducted a point um, for a headbutt in round six and a point for holding in round eight. And also on the card to, to finish it off, Emiliano Vargas now 4-0, and a knockout win for him in two rounds against Edgar Uval, who's now free. I'm saying all of these records wrong. Two and three, two and four, sorry, with with two draws. Edgar Yuval, two and four with two draws. Um, and moving now to the final card to mention, it's a sad one. It took place at the Fiserv Forum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, USA, over here. Roy Jones Jr., friend of the show, living legend, now 66 and 10. He's racked up his 10th loss there, a majority decision loss to UFC vet and boxing debutant Anthony Pettis. It was eight rounds there at Cruiserweight. I heard it was going to be at Heavyweight. I'm not sure what happened. It ended up being at Cruiserweight, 199. And um, yeah, obviously, Roy Jones Jr. racks up another loss. Hopefully, getting to 10 losses will make him... Uh, decide not to continue fighting. We don't want to see this this carry on. But anyway, that brings part one to a close. The final thing for me to do is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the top super middleweight contender, but more importantly, the Islington icon. It is, of course, Mr. John Ryder. John, welcome back on the show, my man. Thank you for having me, Joe. It's, uh, it's nice to be back. <laughs> You're still not let up on the Islington icon. I love it. <laughs> So, John, we last spoke back in October. At that time, you were getting ready to fight Zach Parker. Um, I haven't spoke to you in an interview since then. I was at the fight. I was ringside. Obviously, you were winning the fight for sure at the point of the stoppage. Uh, Zach retired on his stall after four, <laughs> citing that hand injury. Um, you looked super duper angry when when the fight when the fight uh, you know was 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 called by his corner slash him whatever it was. Talk me through that fight, uh, John, if if you don't mind. Mate, you know what? I just like like you say. I felt like I was on top. I felt like I was winning and winning well. Um, I felt like the writing was on the wall. I think that full throw the full throw. I really started turning the screw, and I thought the writing was on the wall. And I mean, once once that came about, like the they was withdrawing him. I didn't really didn't really know where the fight was going from there. I didn't know if it'd go to like judges' scorecard or or what. And, I don't know how the judge would have had it, like being on a on a away show. So I was a bit like they're trying to fuck me. Do you know what I mean? But obviously, all's well ends well, and uh, we got we got the deserved win. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, on to the next one. May the 6th in Mexico, you'll be boxing for the undisputed super middleweight world titles against Canelo Alvarez. Firstly, what an unbelievable opportunity for you here, John. Um, in recent years, in, and to be honest, not just recent years, but your whole career, nothing's been given to you on a plate. You're, you're probably the most improved fighter in British boxing. And I don't think anyone can begrudge you this opportunity, surely. No, I think, listen... I've paid my dues to this sport. I've got myself back from the brink and back into contention. And listen, I, I know now I deserve this shot. Um, it's not been given to me. It's not been handed to me on a plate. I worked hard over and over again to get into this position. And listen, I deserve this. And come May 6th, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what I truly deserve to be mine. And what's the reaction been like from your, your fans, your friends, your family to this fight being signed and sealed, John? People think I'm crazy for the thing of like putting it out there of going to Mexico, but like, I think give a champion respect. If you want to fight a champion and beat a champion, you got to, you kind of expect to go to their backyard. And I know he does most of his fighting in Vegas, but I know it was said that he won the homecoming. And listen... To take an opportunity like this, you, you, you would fight anywhere. Yeah, no, I get that completely. And John, surely commercially and financially, this is the biggest fight that you could have ever been involved in in any point of your career, quite honestly. No, the, the rematch would be even bigger. <laughs> Tell me how you see the fight playing out, John. 
man, just envisage it, just, just me, my hand being raised at the end, um, whether it comes by KO or points, I could, I've got it in my arsenal to to stop him, to outbox him. I, I believe, I believe ty- in boxing, I think timing is everything. And this is, I feel like I'm, I'm coming off my career best year, whereas he's really coming off his career worst with the way things have gone through him last year. Uh, injury, um, uh, losing to Bivol, obviously. Let last the performance against Golovkin in the third and final fight, and like I say, time is everything. I've come off the win against Jacobs and then Len Parker, so I just believe that the time is right for me now. I'm in the best headspace mentally and physically, so I just look forward to what what can be. And obviously, you know, I know you're an honest guy. I know that you obviously must rate Canelo massively, like we all do. But um, you're you're as big as a I think seven and a bit maybe eight to one underdog is that is that fair can you understand why that's the case or not yeah i get it um it's a, and, uh, the bookies can uh can call it what they want there'll be a few people uh, earning some money that night but it is what it is there's got to be a there's got to be an underdog and i'm happy to take that role i feel like i often perform my best when i've got that that label on me so this fight will be no different yeah, no, I agree with that statement, absolutely. And also, you were there Saturday um, at the O2. I wanted to get your reaction to Anthony Joshua uh, with his points win over Jermaine Franklin. Not many people called it. I actually did. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I didn't see it. I, was, I think I was hoping to see a vintage AJ come out, a real dog, and just blast through him. But it's hard, man. So third, third trainer in three fights, man. Takes, I know, like, training your trainer, it takes time to adjust. So, I mean, don't expect him to run before he can walk. There's new things being drilled into him, new new regimes and whatnot. So, it takes time, do you know what I mean? Rome weren't built in a day and stuff. But, um, I think we see signs of improvement. His hand placement was nice. He was sitting inside in the pocket a bit, catching shots from the gloves. Um, we didn't see the, the big combos, the, the one-two finishing off with the backhand, like the hook to the body or the head, but listen, it's like we look at the Franklin that gave Dillian White a fight and AJ's outboxing for 12 rounds really, do you know what I mean? So it's like, there's always got to be comparisons, but he pushed them both, do you know what I mean? So that sets out for a good second fight, well, third fight between Dillian and AJ now. Yeah, yeah, if you count the amateur uh, one, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, a lot of people obviously wanted to see Anthony Joshua, like you say, get in there, be the vintage AJ, smash him in, you know, in the first half of the fight. It's something that's kind of crazy now, but he hasn't knocked anyone out in the first half of a fight for I think six and a half years, which is so mad. So I just couldn't see him doing it with Franklin, and thought that four to one for points was quite nice. Um, obviously, it came in. Moving on though, uh, did you get to see uh, Benavidez plant, John? I, I didn't see. I've seen the highlights. Um, okay. I've not done it out for the fight, and I've not I've not watched it back as of yet. Um, but I think, listen, Clark, uh, so Benavidez is, is a huge super middleweight, and I, I I thought the sheer size of him would be not only impossible for Plant to to win anyway, because he's just he is what's it, a Mexican monster. He is a monster. He's huge. He's uh, massive. I don't know how much longer he's got a super middleweight, but I think it'd be too long. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you know, you've got bigger fish to fry right now anyway, so forget about them little ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> just finally, John, uh, just coming to the end, man, like I say, always great having you on. Any closing words to the listeners before we let you go, my man? No, I just thank you for the support. You've been there through the good, you've been there through the bad, and... um you kept the faith, so thank you to all your listeners and yourself. Um, we got there eventually, and it's all about the hard work's not done yet. There's still hard work to remain, still a fight to win, but it's looking good. It certainly is, man. I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon for you. Like I say, I don't think anyone can begrudge you this opportunity. Listen, John, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my man. Best of luck out there in Mexico, May 6th, and we'll speak sometime afterwards. And the new. Lovely. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it, mate. 
Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. Three fights have been added to that Javante Davis, Ryan Garcia undercard. We're going to see the WBA super middleweight champion, David Morrell Jr., get in there with Senna Agbeko, who uh, is a massive puncher. That's in the co main there. We're also going to see Gabe Rosado rematch Bektamir Melikuziev, the bully. Um, obviously, people will remember Gabe Rosado getting that unbelievable knockout win the best knockout of 2021 or whenever it was 2022 i can't remember now um so it's great to see that fight again um elsewhere on that card we'll see the undefeated 19 year old elijah garcia getting in there with mexico's kevin salgado as well so that's three fights there added to that card in other news um yeah, a bit of a mad one, actually. Amir Khan has uh, reportedly fouled a drugs test off the back of that um, Kell Brook uh, fight that he had. Obviously, he ended up losing that fight, and he's been handed a two-year ban. I cannot remember right now what the drug is, and I probably should have had it written down somewhere. But whatever drug it is, Amir Khan has denied, obviously, taking the drug and he's been slapped with a two-year ban, which he pretty much laughed off and said he's retired anyway. Like, what's the point of giving me this ban? I don't really care about it. But he does want to fight to clear his name. He says he's innocent. So I guess we're going to see more on that one. But it's, it's a lot of um, outrage that we're seeing this reported so far after that fight. I think it's been over a year now since that fight. And we're only just hearing about these findings, which is crazy. And in other news, a very quick turnaround for Lawrence Sicoli. He defends his WBO World Cruiserweight title against Chris Billum Smith, his former gym mate. Obviously, they both trained under Shane McGuigan. Lawrence Sicoli didn't look too great. What was it, a week ago, two weeks ago, when he boxed um, uh, whoever he boxed? David Light, I think it was. But here we go. He gets in with Chris Billum Smith. And, um, yeah, the date for that is May 27th. It's going down at Bournemouth FC Stadium there. So it's a very, very quick turnaround there for Lawrence Acoli. Um In other news, one Cruiserweight Cracker 2 mention as well. We're going to see it go down. It's going to be live on BT Sport at the York Hall Friday the 12th of May. We're going to see Ellis Zorro fighting for the vacant WBO European Cruiserweight title against Josea Burton. So that's just a bit of an under-the-radar fight there that I think... Uh, could be quite interesting, could be quite fun. Uh, what else do we have to round it off? Um, May the 20th, we're going to see Oscar Valdez take on Adam Lopez. That's a rematch there. And also a good fight. I really like this one. Raymond Muratala gets in with Jeremiah Nakafila. That one is going to be on the Haney Lomachenko pay-per-view undercard at the MGM Grand so, um, yeah, so look out for those two fights there on that undercard there. That is it, though, for the news. Moving out now to Japan. We're going to start here at the Ariaki Arena in Kotoku in Tokyo. Over here, a few fights to mention. Kenshiro Taraji. Uh, he gets in with Anthony Oloskuaga, who I'm not entirely sure is. Um, haven't seen him fight before. He's only 5-0, and oh, but he gets in there with Taraji, which seems a bit mad in only a sick fight. It's for the WBA Super and WBC World Light Flyweight titles. Kenshiro Taraji, the big favourite there. Uh, Takuma Inoue, 17-1, and one, gets in with tough man Liborio Solis, 35-6 and six with a draw. Remember uh, him fighting Jamie McDonnell and losing extremely narrowly in Monaco one time. Um, that is for the vacant WBA World Bantamweight title. We're also going to see Kiko Martinez, the Spanish legend. Um, 44 and 11 with two draws these days. He gets in with Raya Abe, who is 24 and 3 with a draw. Um, he's a slight underdog, Kiko Martinez, but there might be some smart money on him. I've looked through this guy um, Raya Abe's record and I'm not impressed at all by what I'm seeing. So I'm not sure what that's all about, but he is traveling. So maybe... You know, maybe you might have to dig deep, but he has dug deep before, and all the best to him. Uh, moving out now to this one, just another complete, complete under-the-radar fight to mention, which I bet probably no other podcast will mention, but this one goes down um, at the Peacock in Cannon Town. Just one fighter to mention on this card over here is the return to the ring for Armit Patterson who, if you've been a boxing fan for a long time, especially if you follow the domestic scene here in the UK, you might remember him. He hasn't boxed for over seven years. He was going to be... He's undefeated. His record's 17-0. But he was going to be fighting Liam Williams, I believe, for the British title at the time. And he was jogging, doing his road work, and then he... 
he had some kind of um, disagreement while he was running along with a bunch of guys and um, something happened and I believe they chased after him with a brick, hit him over the head and we haven't seen him in seven years so he's back here so good luck to him, no opponent just yet but he's back at welterweight over four rounds there so yeah I think he's been doing some private um you know one-on-one -on -one training and stuff and a bit of modeling if i'm not mistaken in the meantime so all the best to, to him there on his return to the ring a long long time out there moving now to the dignity health sports park in carson california usa this one's going to be live on showtime let's fly through this uh we've got chris Ariola ready cannot believe he's still going 38 and 7 with a draw he gets in with matthew mckinney who's 13 and 6 with three draws that's over eight rounds there We've got Gabriella Fundora, the towering Inferno sister. 10 and 0. She gets in with Maria Santizo, who's 11 and 2. That's over eight two minute rounds there at flyweight. I can't believe she's only a flyweight. She's massive for that weight. She's super tall, just like. Um, just like Sebastian Fandora. Also on the card, we don't really like watching him too often. Um, Frank Sanchez, 21-0. and 0. He gets in there with Daniel Martz, who's 20-10 and 10 with a draw. I think Daniel Martz has been knocked out in all 10 of his losses. They're taking bets to see if the fight will even go past one round. So Frank Sanchez expected to get an early knockout. Also on the card, Gabriel Maestra, who's 4-0 and 0 with a draw. Um, a draw last time out to that guy from the Ukraine. I think his name's Taras Shelestuk. And he was an undefeated fighter, I believe. And that was a bit of a kind of questionable draw. And then the fight before that, if we if we don't forget, was when he completely, blatantly got a gift decision against Michael Fox. Well, he's back in a 10-rounder here against Devon Alexander, who, of course, is way over the hill now. All the best to Devon Alexander, though, because I want to see this guy Maestro beat, I think, because I think he's very, very, very lucky to not already have perhaps two losses on his record. I think his record should be like three and two. But yeah, Devon Alexander probably not going to have enough left in the tank to win this one. 27-7 and seven with a draw. Friend of the show. All the best to him. Elsewhere on the card, we also have Brandon Lee, 27-0. and 0, um, Loves the knockout. It's over 10 rounds. He gets in there with Pedro Camper, who is 34-2 and 2 with a draw. Um, I think he was the fighter that Tiafimo Lopez boxed in his first fight at 140, if I'm not mistaken. And I think he got him out there, if my memory serves me correct, about round 6, round 7, somewhere around there. Um, it's going to be a good test, I think, though, for Brandon Lee, because I don't think Tiafimo found Camper that easy. Uh, also on the card, Luis Nunes, 18-0, gets in there with Christian Bereda, who is 20-0 with a draw. That could be exciting there, over 10. And then all eyes to the main event for the WBC interim world super welterweight title, Sebastian Fundora, the tower in inferno himself, 20-0 with a draw, over 12 rounds against Brian Mendoza, who's 21-2. Um... They're expecting this one to go to distance, actually. And uh, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's going to be fun. It always is fun when we see the towering inferno. You know, he is, he is like, a, like a stick in the wind, you know, when it's really windy. And a stick is just flying back and forth. But he's brutal uh, every way he sways. So I want to see him get the job done, hopefully by stoppage. Moving out now to the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey, USA. You might be there, Eddie. You might not, maybe not. It's going to be live on ESPN. Top in the bill, Shakur Stevenson, 19-0, and friend of the show. He gets in there with the undefeated Shushiro Yoshino, who's 16-0. and It's over 12 rounds, of course, and it is Shakur Stevenson's first fight up at lightweight. I love watching him fight. He really is um, one of the boxers that you watch and say, this is an art, this game of boxing. It's not a brutal sport like a lot of people think it is. It's not two guys going in there, beating the hell out of each other, punching each other in the head. He makes boxing look, you know, like an art, like it's supposed to. And um, really excited to see how he looks here against Yoshino, who's a good fighter as well. He can certainly bang 12 KOs from his 16 wins. Been in there with some decent names, you know, was able to beat Masayuki Ito, was able to knock out um, in his last fight uh, Masayoshi Nakatani, who, by the way, Lomachenko took nine rounds to get rid of. Tiafimo Lopez went the distance with. He got him out in six rounds, so that was quite impressive, and he's coming off of that. So he's in some good form. He's in the form of his career, it would appear. Um, also on the card, we should mention... Keyshawn Davis, I love watching him fight as well. He gets in there. He's seven and zero. He's in a ten rounder. He gets in there with Anthony Yidget, who's twenty six and two with a draw these days. Um, I'd expect Keyshawn to get the stoppage there. I think he's just too accurate, too good, and um, 
He's going to have too much, really, for Yijit, who at one point in his career was a really, really solid, durable, tough fighter. And, you know, he gave everyone a hard night's work over here in the UK. But when he's gone out there to the States, I think he boxed Baranchik over there, uh, boxed Rolando Romero. You know, he's come up very short and um, I don't think he's really got much left in the tank. So it's probably a great time to get him. Also on the card, it's going to be really good this one between two undefeated heavyweights. We've got Jared Anderson, the real big baby, friend of the show, 13-0 and in a 10-rounder against George Arias, who's 18-0, and the Dominican fighter, seven KOs. Um beat Cassius Cheney as well. He was actually the guy that took Cassius Cheney's O. He's got a couple of other standout names along his record. But um, yeah, I mean, Jared Anderson last time out looked brutal against Jerry Forrest. So I'm expecting the same for him. He's still got that 100% knockout streak running. So long may it continue. I love watching the real big baby fight. So good on his feet as well. And also on the, sh on, on the, uh, the, the card as well, Recent friend of the show, he was on a few weeks ago, Troy Isley, 8-0, and he gets in there with Roy Barringer, who's 9-3, and that's over 8 rounds there, um, never been stopped, Roy Barringer, so perhaps, perhaps Troy Isley might be the first guy to do it, we shall see, all the best to him, all the best to Shakur as well on that card, and moving now to the final card to take to take place, uh, the final card that we're going to mention at the Bowen Center in in San Antonio, Texas, USA. It's going to be live on the zone. Let's start with the undercard. We've got Mark Castro, 9-0, and looking for double-figure wins. He gets in there with Ricardo Lopez Torres, who's 16-6 and with three draws. It's over eight rounds. All the best to Mark Castro, who has the best teeth in boxing, I always say. Um, Israel Madrimov as well, 8-0 and with a draw, gets in there with Rafael Igbokwe, who is 16-3. and now, I know that Igbokwe has done a lot of sparring in the past, I believe, with Regis Progre. Um, and I thought, okay, like he, he's supposed to be pretty good from what I heard. And I remember him fighting, um, oh God, um, Sergei Boachuk. And basically, yeah, he, he, he lost that fight. And I, I, I thought, wow, because, you know, obviously... Bohachuk is quite limited, even though he can bang. He's got real, real, you know, hugely heavy hands but he got him out of there in six rounds that was his last fight um which was over a year ago now he's been out the ring a year and a half he gets in with Israel Madrimov obviously coming off that technical draw last time out against Michel Soro and the fight before that was a fight against uh, Michel Soro as well I think he just wants to leave Soro in the past and move on to brighter days and he looks to do that against Rafael Igbokwe so um, I'd expect him to do that I think he'll probably stop him I think if um, if Boachuk can get you out of there I think Madrimov probably will get him out of there but I think he certainly wins I don't think he loses this one uh, moving up the card once again Raymond Ford 13-0 and with a draw gets in there with former world champion Jesse Magdaleno 29-1 and that one loss came to Isaac Dogbe who we mentioned earlier on it's over 12 rounds no belt on the line so I'm told Really tough fight, I think. I mean, a lot of people say that Raymond Ford is the best prospect in world boxing. I think we're going to find out here for sure. Um, I think he's looked really good at times, and some other times, he, I don't think he's impressed me that much. But he gets in with Magdaleno, who, of course, probably isn't the same fighter he used to be. But he's coming off a couple of decent wins as well, I should mention, as well, since losing to Dog Bay. So it's certainly not going to be a walk in the park for here for Raymond Ford. So I'm really looking to... Um, or looking forward, I should say, to what we see from him. I think we're going to see a lot of answered questions, or a lot of questions asked might be a better way of saying it. Elsewhere on the card as well, we're going to see Jesse Bam Rodriguez, 17-0. and He gets in with Christian Hernandez, who's 15-1. and It's for the vacant WBO World Flyweight title. I'm guessing Christian Hernandez somehow got himself into the top rankings or whatever. He must be ranked highly for this one to be for the vacant WBO, but... I had never heard of this guy at all, and I'm going to hold my hands up and apologize if everyone knows who he is and I don't, and that means I'm not a hardcore boxing fan, but I was looking for his record. I was like, how did this guy get ranked in the top, you know, in the top of the division, which I'm assuming he must have been to get the vacant shot, but yeah, this is just, you know, this is Jesse Bam Rodriguez fight to win and probably to win well, probably to win by knockout and down at flyweight where I think he's more suited to anyway, so it's going to be good to see him. Back out again, he was very, very active last year, you know, I think he fought God knows how many times, and I think by like the fourth or whatever fight he had of the year, the final fight he had of the year I think was around December time, and he looked a bit like he was kind of spent really, like it had been such a busy year, obviously he's had 
you know, a few months off here, and he comes back, and um, I'm expecting an explosive performance from him. And then the final fight to mention, the main event on this card, I believe it is, or maybe it's the chief support, I'm not entirely sure, but Murajon Akhmadaliev, 11-0, he puts his IBF and WBA Super World Super Bantamweight titles on the line against the Filipino Marlon Tapales, who's 36-3. and um, A lot of people were turning their nose up at this fight, saying that, you know, Akhmadaliev's going to win this quite easily and that Topales isn't all that good. But I've got to say, in recent times, these Filipinos, man, they seem to just be turning it up when they're not expected to. You know, like they don't seem to feel much pressure in the big situations. And um, I mean, I give him a chance. I don't think I would I would want to bet on him to win, but I certainly do give him a chance. Um, just makes me think of recent times where Filipinos have upset the odds. I'm thinking of... Um, the guy that beat Jojo Diaz a few weeks ago. I'm thinking of um, um, Mark Magseo, obviously, beating Gary Russell Jr. So, in recent times, the Filipinos have turned up and showed out. But I guess Tapales is probably a little bit more exposed than they were. Um, you know, he's got a couple of losses on the slate. And um, he's been around a long time as well. Like I said, that's why I say he's not... He's, he's a bit more exposed. Been a pro for 15 years now. So, yeah, we're going to see what, what, what will happen there. But I guess Akhmadaliev probably should have a bit a bit too much in the tank. But I do like seeing him fight. And he actually needs to go towards the bigger fights. I wanted to see him fight Stephen Fulton. I don't know if that's still on the on the, on the the table at the minute. But that would be a cracking fight. I just, I just want to see him... In big fights, he's a unified world champion, only 11 fights in, and, you know, it's it's fantastic. Well, let's not stall it now. Let's go for the bigger fights and see what you can really do and really make yourself a, a household name. Um, but, yeah, brilliant fight, obviously, with um, Danny Roman. That was a real cracker there. But, anyway, that brings the preview part to a close. In part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest, John Ryder. In part two, we did the news. I've just wrapped up the preview part there. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 390 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to this week's special guest, the top super middleweight world contender, Mr. John Ryder. All the best, of course, to him in his quest to become the undisputed super middleweight champion of the world on May the 6th in Mexico. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Like I say, thanks once again for tuning in to this week's show. If you do have a spare final Five minutes or not even that a spare two minutes please leave us a review on itunes or on spotify or wherever you listen to the podcast it's available on all platforms a little review really does go a long long way and if you want to improve your below the waist hygiene then you can visit our sponsor www.manscaped.com and use that promo code box hard for 20 percent off plus free shipping but that's about everything from myself enjoy your weekends people stay safe and we shall see you all again next week